Hi, I'm George and welcome to part 21 of the Horizon series. Now this week we take a bit of a detour from our normal construction and we're going to have a look at an issue that we need to solve for the Horizon sustainer when it's flown as a two-stage configuration. So let's have a look at that issue. As we've seen before in our experiments, at first stage burnout the entire rocket undergoes deceleration partly due to drag. This causes the water inside the sustainer to move up away from the nozzle. If you then stage the rocket, the air near the nozzle will mostly escape before the water settles back down again. This results in a significant loss of performance of the sustainer. Orbital class rockets have a similar problem in microgravity if they try to relight liquid fueled engines. Here is a view inside the fuel tank of a Falcon 9 rocket when the engines stop firing. The fuel just floats around and away from the engine's fuel intake line. So what are our options? We could stage the rocket just after burnout but before deceleration really starts. The timing here would be important. And it wouldn't let us coast for a couple of seconds if we wanted to. One way big rockets solve this problem is by using small rockets to accelerate the entire tank causing the fuel to settle at the bottom of the tank and then lighting the main engines. These kinds of motors are called eulage motors. On a water rocket, it really isn't practical to have a eulage motor, but we could use something that gives a similar effect, like a launch tube. A launch tube allows the sustainer to accelerate without the loss of water or air. After burnout, while the water is floating away from the nozzle, you release the sustainer. This causes the sustainer to accelerate up the launch tube forcing the water to collect near the nozzle. Only once the launch tube leaves the nozzle will water start flowing. The main disadvantage is the added weight of the launch tube, which has to be strong enough to withstand the high pressures and forces involved. Another alternative is to place a baffle inside the sustainer's pressure chamber just above the water line. The baffle should stop most of the water from moving upwards while still allowing air to flow down when the sustainer is released. Our regular water rocket sustainers were made out of segments and so had several narrow sections along the length of the rocket. These would act as baffles to prevent most of the water from moving upward. In Horizon this is a different story because the entire pressure chamber is just one long tube, there is nothing to prevent the water from moving up. For today's experiment we decided to have a look at baffles to see how they affect the flow of the water inside the long tube. We got a long piece of T8 FTC tubing because it's clear and lets us see what's inside it. We then 3D printed a set of closures with O-rings that sealed both ends. And finally we printed a set of baffles that we'd mount inside the tube. The tube was filled with water and food colouring to make it easier to see. We filled it up almost to the baffle. This tube was taped to the side of one of our regular rockets and a bracket was made to hold a camera to the side so that we could watch what the water was doing near the baffle. Three, two, one, go! First, let's have a look at how the water behaves without a baffle during deceleration. In this view, you can see how quickly that occurs after burnout. Let's see that again in slow motion. The water can't move up as a slug because it would create a vacuum at the nozzle end and so you end up with water flowing up one side and air moving down on the other side to fill that void. first level out. Nice. For the next launch we introduced a conical baffle with a hole in the middle. The hole in this case is about 22% of the cross-sectional area of the tube. The idea is to try to make the hole as big as possible to allow maximum airflow once the sustainer is released. But not too big so that it doesn't stop the water from moving up. When the rocket is launched, you can see that this baffle is very effective in stopping the water moving up. A bubble forms here that doesn't try to go any further. And here it is again in slow motion. The hole is just small enough that it makes it difficult for the water to flow in one direction and air to flow in the other. So a baffle is quite effective at stopping the water moving up, 
but for efficiency, how large can we make this hole? For the next flight, we tried a baffle with a hole that was about 45% of the cross-sectional area. Three, two, one, go! During this launch, we can see that the baffle wasn't as effective at stopping the water, and quite a bit of it leaked above the baffle. So this tells us that a baffle would be an effective way to help prevent water from moving. Of course, we have to keep in mind that the deceleration and horizon will be much more significant and the tube diameter is also larger. So there will be some differences between it and this experiment. Well, Charlie, the sustainer's already built, so it's not easy to add a baffle to it, but we'll certainly look at adding a baffle if we ever need to rebuild the sustainer. Uh, a baffle also is a lot lighter than a high pressure launch tube and it also allows us to create foam, something that's not as easy to do with a launch tube. We can still use Charlie in test flights where we stage just after burnout, so that's perfectly fine, and we'll probably do that first up. The launch day that you saw didn't quite start out the way we were expecting to, so here is what happened on the first couple of launch attempts. As we brought the rocket up to pressure and were about to launch it, the bottom of the top bottle blew out, sending the deployment mechanism flying. This bottle must have seen hundreds of pressure cycles over the years and finally gave way. We are prepared for these kinds of situations and we simply unscrew the top bottle and screw in a new one with a different deployment mechanism already fitted. There was not even need to remove the rocket from the launch pad. Ten minutes later we were ready to try again. And this time I'm one of the very it. old splices also gave out and disintegrated the rocket. Again this splice would have gone through hundreds of pressure cycles but what are the chances that two different parts should give out so close together? It's been quite a while since the last failure. You can see how the FTC tube folded during the explosion, but it sprung back and it was fine to use again. So we replaced the broken splice bottle with an equally old one, reattached the experiment and we're ready to go. We then carried out the three flights you saw earlier in the video. Well, that's all for this week. In the next video, we're going to jump back into construction and we're going to start cutting real metal for the launcher. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.